A man had called in on a cell phone stating that his wife and child had fallen off of a cliff. He went on to say that uh, he didn't know if they were dead or not, but he could hear them gurgling. The man on the phone identifies himself as Bob Duke, but cannot give Alvis Deffer a good fix on his location. 40 minutes later, Alvis Deffer finds Duke at the top of a cliff. In a heap on the rocks below lie Duke's wife, Leanna, and his five-year-old son, Eric. Duke tells police the young family had chosen the cliff for their afternoon picnic. His wife and child were out on the point. His child was chasing lizards. He had went back to his vehicle to get something to drink when he heard his wife yell his name. He went out onto the point and found them missing. He looked over the edge and saw the bodies. The top of the cliff is flat and littered with broken rock. At the edge is a drop of more than 100 feet. Duke tells Alva Steffer he tried, but was unable to get down the cliff to check on his family. The Green River Fire Department is called to the scene. Unlike Bob Duke, they find the slope surrounding this particular cliff to be less than treacherous. We went about 30, 40 yards north and walked down the hill to the victims. It wasn't real easy. It was pretty steep terrain, uh, very rocky, a lot of loose rock. Uh, but it wasn't that difficult. We've dealt with worse. All of the rescue personnel, however, have an uneasy feeling about the deaths of Leanna and Eric Duke. None of them are convinced it was an accident. It just didn't seem right. The whole, the whole deal, the whole situation was not right in my mind. Several things bothered the crew. First, contrary to what Bob Duke claims, the cliff itself is not hard to negotiate. In fact, it only takes rescue workers a few minutes to walk to the bodies. Second, there is Duke's attitude at the scene. Not what you would expect from a man who has just seen his entire family killed at an afternoon picnic. He seemed very nonchalant at the time. It's, to begin with, I was attributing it towards shock, but the more conversation that I, I listened to him have with, with other people, I just, it, it didn't sit right with me. Beyond Duke himself is the cliff and its obvious dangers. Common sense tells the workers a mother would never take her child anywhere close to its edge. With no hard evidence of foul play, the deaths are ruled to be accidental. Bob Duke collects $60,000 in life insurance, and the case is closed before it ever gets a chance to go cold. The case stays closed for two and a half years until Bob Duke's best friend tells police of a conversation he once had with Duke. In the fall of 1998, Roger takes a call from his old friend. Bob Duke has a favor to ask. He says, well, I want you to do something for me. I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, well, I want you to kill my parents. And he offered me 20 grand. He goes, I know you need the money. I'm giving you the first offer, the first you know, shot at this. He goes, whether you do it or not, it will be done. Roger should be surprised at Bob's offer, but he isn't. According to Braunberger, Bob Duke asked him to kill his wife and son two and a half years earlier, in 1996, shortly before they fell to their deaths from a cliff in Wyoming. He said, okay, how much is it gonna cost? He goes, I'll give you 20 grand. He goes, I'll leave a 22 out behind the shed. We'll be barbecuing Thursday. Shoot me in the arm, try and miss the bone. Shoot my wife and kid in the head and chest. And take out as many neighbor kids as you need to to make it not look so isolated. And I told him, this is, this, is out, this is out of line, it's crazy. And then on the third, third and final time he offered me money to kill his wife, I told him, you need to do yourself a favor and get a divorce. Uh, you know, because this is just really acceptable. It's, you can't just go around killing people. When Brauberger had first learned about the deaths of Leanna and Eric, he immediately suspected it was no accident. He did not, however, approach police or confront his friend. If I went to the police, it would have been my word against his and I would have been attacking, you know, someone that, verbally attacking someone that just went through a personal tragedy, and he would have known that I suspected that he was, up, that he was behind it. 
Now, two and a half years later, Bob Duke is back and wants his parents dead. This time, Brauberger decides he needs to talk with someone. Roger Brauberger calls Mont Meekum, father of an old schoolmate and a lieutenant with the Green River Police Department. Brauberger tells Meekum about Bob Duke's plans for his parents and what Brauberger suspects about Duke's dead wife and child. The thing that probably convinced me the most was his state of panic. I mean, this was somebody that was in need of some help. And we walked him through the story for probably two hours. And anytime someone makes that type of an allegation, your next step is to uh, get proof somehow. Meekum sets up a phone sting and asks Brauberger to push for specifics on how Duke wants his parents killed. By the time they get Duke on the phone, his plans have changed. Now he asks Brauberger only to act as a lookout, while Duke himself shoots his parents in their home. What was the plan then? I suppose like a uh, signal? Like a little like... Uh, that's just, uh, that's something, uh, I, I don't know yet. It, it's gonna depend, you know, when he, it might be something like, you know, if the porch light is off, mm -hmm. turn it on. Okay. I mean, something simple like that. Isn't it gonna be like loud, it's gonna wake the neighbors or nothing, is it? No. Okay, cool. Yeah. The recording puts some substance behind Brauberger's story. Meekum puts in a call to the FBI, which agrees to get involved in the case. Todd Scott is a special agent with the Bureau. Scott doesn't have to dig very far to find a motive for murder. Since 1996, Bob Duke has lived off the insurance money from his wife and son's death. Now that money is gone. If his parents were dead, Bob Duke would stand to receive a fresh infusion of insurance cash. Scott and Meekum agree. The best way to build their case is with more specific admissions from the suspect himself. They set up a second phone sting, with Roger Brauberger now posing as an eager trigger man. Remember when we talked before about the 20,000 for killing your parents? Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm thinking I might want that. Do it. On January 8th, FBI agents burst into a home in Houston, Texas, and arrest Bob Duke for conspiring to kill his parents. Four months later, he pleads guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and is sentenced to 10 years at a federal penitentiary. Two potential murders have been prevented, but that still leaves Bob Duke's wife and son. Their deaths, long considered accidents, now appear to be nothing short of murder. Well, I actually didn't think I could make a case, but considering the fact that Mr. Duke was probably lying about what happened at the scene, then we had a homicide. After 16 months of legwork, their case against Bob Duke still lacks any hard forensic edge. It was difficult. You'd always like to have some absolutely indisputable forensic evidence in any court case. And we had almost none. The case against Bob Duke is not perfect, but as good as it's going to get. And in the eyes of investigators, well beyond any reasonable doubt, with indictments for murder in hand, the state prepares to try Duke for killing his wife and son. On August 12, 2002, Bob Duke's murder trial begins. The prosecution relies heavily on its star witness, Roger Brauberger, who recounts Duke's request that Brauberger kill his wife and son. The second major element in the state's case, the cliffs of the Flaming Gorge. Any reasonable person who goes out there and looks at this crime scene is going to know that Leanna Duke, on her worst day, would not have allowed her son to get close enough to the edge of this cliff to fall off accidentally. And that's the case right there. On August 15th, the jury gets into a bus and drives out to the Flaming Gorge. One by one, they peer over the cliffs down into a field of rocks that served as Leanna and Eric Duke's deathbed. Eight days later, they agree with Harold Moneyhun and return a verdict of murder in the first degree. Bob Duke is sentenced to life in prison for the murder of his wife and son and the attempts to murder his parents. <laughs> 